my name's uh, Mario Hara, and I'm with the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. So as um, Jennings already said, this is what our talk is gonna be about, and it's focused around the um, modeling exposure through Earth Observation Routines project that HOT had been doing, which is funded by the UK Space Agency as part of the international uh, partnership programs. So what is exposure, really? So when we're talking about exposure, we're generally looking at buildings, people, and also development patterns. So it's anything kind of that could be impacted by hazards. Um, and so with exposure data, what we were looking at in, for this project, we're actually looking at collecting that. So you can, a lot of this data for exposure data, you can actually see from satellite imagery, from Earth observations. So you know that it's very common for OpenStreetMap data, you can remotely digitize with satellite imagery. And what we were doing, well actually our team, our team, our colleagues in um, Nepal at Kathmandu Living Labs, they were doing the remote digitization, which was then followed by data collecting on the ground. Similarly, our um, colleagues in Ramani Huria, they were doing the same in Dar es Salaam. And when they're collecting detailed um, attribute information on the ground, so not only did they have digitized the building footprints, they were going out and collecting detailed information looking at structural attributes of a building. So when I say detailed structural information, like for a building, what does that mean? So this is just an example of um, one of the attributes that we were looking at. And we're actually looking at the, load, uh, the lateral load resisting system of a building. And so here, this is a moment resisting frame. And that actually is like the part of the building. So if it was impacted, say, by an earthquake, that would help determine, you know, it's how resistant it was to that earthquake. And then we were also looking at other um, attributes, such as the material of that system, along with some others, which my colleague will talk more about later. And so, oh, sorry, the X is meant to be after the hazards. But um, so we were focusing on exposure data, and we were actually supporting um, ImageCat, who are looking at doing, uh, creating exposure data sets at different levels. Um, but you can't just have exposure data on its, by itself to actually look at the impacts of what's going to happen to it. So you also need to know, you also have to have hazard data, um, which our colleagues at the British Geological Survey have been uh, working on, and then also vulnerability data, which looks at a little bit more of like the socio um, situation and then the economic situation as well that you know, makes someone vulnerable in the situation. And so this was collected, this was um, data produced by the global earthquake model. And so when you have all of those, you're able to then assess you know, what the risk is. And the risk is really you know, what will happen to those that people and buildings and infrastructure that are exposed when the impact, uh, when the hazard takes place. And so going back again, how does OSM data fit into this? So ImageCat, they're looking at creating um, five different levels of exposure data. And so you've got your global level, um, at the country level, subnational, aggregated building, and building specific. And the ones highlighted in red are the ones that um, OpenStreetMap data is helping to build. And so what we did by going on the ground and actually collecting um, the data and you know, the different structural attributes, they then can go and Ooh, let me get my notes on that, just to make sure I do it right. Um, because, yeah, so they have, once we are helping them identify the development patterns based on the um, building attributes, they, with um, Earth observation data, have actually identified homogenous zones of where they think the development patterns are the same. But we're actually going on the ground and verifying that, yes, it is indeed, you know, what you think. Um, and these are the different attributes that when impacted, you know, this is what, they can then run it into a model and they are able to determine, you know, with those structural attributes, the point of failure or the, you know, the percentage of failure for that. And once you know the failure um, of your buildings, you can then calculate that by your replacement costs and that will help you understand your percentage of damage for 
certain areas, depending on the scale you're looking at, if it's at a country level, subnational. Um, and then this is really important because you know, once you know your percentage of damage or areas that are more prone to fail, this helps decision makers you know, focus on who's vulnerable, who's gonna be more impacted than others. They can also decide if they need to retrofit buildings to you know, make sure that we'll be able to withstand different um, hazards and then also do better financial planning as well. So yeah, the other purpose of why we're you know, using OSM data to help support these different levels of um, exposure data is because really when it comes down to it being processed in a model, you have to have them all at the same spatial and resolution scale for them to actually work together. And so it's very easy for us to you know, pull out OSM data and look at it on, you know, at the building level, at level five, but using it to actually help improve the accuracy of the different levels is a really great uh, way that we're able to support. And so again, with this project, you know, it's contributing, we've kind of mentioned this throughout a lot of talks um, here, um, it's supporting a lot of the sustainable development goals. And so here it's helping sustainable development goal 11 and 13. And then the end of the project, we're really looking to deliver um, exposure data for 46 countries of the least developed um, ODA countries, creating open protocols on actually how to develop not only exposure information, but also the hazard and the vulnerability da data set so that governments or anyone that need, uh, would like to reproduce it also know how to do that. And a part of that is, I'm sure a lot of people here know, it's not just about creating the documentation, it's actually showing them how to use it and you know, making it more feasible because there's just so much documentation and platforms and data and it's, you know, it's over, overbearing in a bit. Um, yeah, and so actually a bit more into the process of how we did the data collection and everything like that, I'm gonna pass it over to Gora from KLL. Ooh, there go. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Gaurav Thapa, and so I'm from Kathmandu Living Labs, which is a non-for-profit company in, based in Kathmandu. So we work in the field of uh, what we call civic technology, so technology that we hope uh, transforms people's lives and is, is close to people and, and how they're living in, in the world and interacting with the world. And so they can actually relate to it and that's hopefully going to help them. Um, uh, in our organization, uh, we do a range of things, uh, but OSM is our flagship uh, topic and field where we work. And uh, uh, I'll be talking about exactly what we did with HOT, but like we also work on OpenStreetMap in terms of uh, educating people, in terms of trying to create a curriculum for universities, and then also research work. Um, I just wanted to share that one of my colleagues, he just produced a paper called Filling OpenStreetMap Data Gaps in Rural Nepal, a Digital Youth Internship and Leadership Program in an academic journal. So um, it's... Uh, it's fairly interesting work that we're doing all around OpenStreetMap. Um, for this specific project, this was our survey area. So this is actually a map of uh, uh, Kathmandu, the urban core of Kathmandu city. So Kathmandu city is pretty densely populated and uh, has a large, uh, almost, uh, I would say uh, there's probably like five million people inside this valley all, all uh, clustered together. As you can see from the scale, it's not a really large area. Uh, that's a scale of only six, six kilometers over there. So it's not really a large area, but there's a lot of people there and a lot of buildings uh, put back together. Also, uh, what I wanna show in this map is there are these uh, red dots within the shaded area. So, Within this shaded area, each of these dots represented the specific point where we went on the field and then observed the buildings around it. So we observed 10, ten buildings around each of those points and then uh, uh, we validated some of the um, attributes suggested by the remote mapping work as well as uh, produced new survey attributes, uh, the ones that Mari mentioned earlier about moment resisting frames or structural data. Uh, to do this work, um, a normal person can't just go into the field and look at a building and say what sort of structure it has or what sort of material it has. So we trained 
uh, 12 civil engineers who actually have some idea about buildings and can give us a better idea than if I was to go there um, on how to look at a building and see what's in that. Uh, before that, uh, our partners at ImageCat, what they've done is they divided each of these, uh, uh, the area that we were surveying into seven parts based on development patterns. It's also called homogeneous zones. So they looked at the satellite imagery and uh, they guessed that like, you know, because these buildings look similar, they must be of a certain type. So there was like seven different types. Um, so these seven types were residential, dense residential, urban, industrial, informal, high urban, and new industrial. Um, there was an eighth type when they looked at it. It was rural, so we excluded that. So this is all like just urban uh, development patterns. Um, so in total, uh, with these seven development patterns and uh, 10 sites in, in all of these, we were supposed to look at uh, uh, 40 points and then like 10, 10 buildings around each of these points, we we're supposed to collect data of around 2,800 buildings. Um, so, so we did that and uh, these were the attributes that we looked at. Um, I'm just highlighting mostly uh, the two main ones here, the building systems and building materials. But beyond these, uh, there were like, you know, several other attributes that we collected. I'll show that in the results a little later. But I just want to focus on these two initially, just to give you an idea of what people saw and what sort of data they collected. So these are just pictures from the field. Um, and uh, from this image, they would like, you know, give uh, us details about what the attributes are. So in the first image, it's just an image of a house. And I, I put that as an example because um, it tells us about the building material of that house. So for example, this was concrete reinforced. It's reinforced concrete. That was the tag was concrete underscore reinforced. And uh, they were able to like, you know, look at the building from like few angles and say that that's the material that was used. And usually the system uh, and the material, they tend to match. So in this case, uh, normally most of the buildings that, ha that are like concrete reinforced buildings, uh, they have a system called uh, moment resisting frames are built around it. So almost 60%, uh, 64% of the buildings were of this sort. And uh, over here, I've put two images because uh, sometimes uh, the engineers, so they were not allowed to enter inside people's private houses, obviously, or like uh, inside government buildings. It depended what they were allowed to enter and what not. So they had to take photographs from multiple angles. So sometimes they would like zoom in, try and go a little higher up. So over here, they've taken, you know, one, one shot and then like they've tried to get a closer shot by going a little higher up. And that helps them like, you know, figure out exactly what sort of system it is, at least gives them a better idea. Um, one of the big challenges uh, with newer buildings and older buildings is the facade can always change. People might paint over it, they might layer it, so it's, it's difficult to know exactly how that's done. Um, so, it, so it helps when you're able to go around or like see the neighboring buildings and figure out, you know, what date it was like, you know, put around, if it's using certain things that you, you take clues from if the windows are smaller or larger, if there are frames above the window or the door, so these sort of details. So this is an example of a, a brick building, as you can, but the bricks are clearly visible here. Um, and, uh, um, and both of these buildings, but like you can see that some, in this building it clearly has really old, old bricks. This one is new. So obviously we also tried to estimate the date of when these things uh, were built. Uh, the system for this is called a masonry wall system. So there are uh, new buildings that have also appeared. So this is of a um, car showroom in Nepal. And uh, these are like, you know, they're like made really quickly. So these are actually buildings that are steel frame buildings. 
Uh, but there's only a small percentage of buildings like this in Kathmandu, only around 3% are uh, made of this sort of like brick, I um, mean steel style, with steel beams and then just like a facade put on top of it. Um, this is a older building. I mean, you can see the bricks on top, but actually it's a building made of earth, uh, clay material mostly inside of it. And uh, uh, for that, like, you know, the surveyors have to like, you know, uh, sometimes they also have to like ask the people around that area because they might not be sure from just like by visually inspecting a uh, building like that. So I just wanted to show an example or I mean, sometimes they might have like an incorrect data that a senior uh, civil engineer would then later look at and try and like, you know, validate if they're incorrect or correct on this uh, assumptions of theirs. Um, th these two are examples of what we uh, ended up calling a mixed uh, material buildings or a hybrid system. So what you can see clearly in the first image uh, at the lower level, there's like some sort of like wooden frames uh, propping it, but then above there's a masonry structure. I mean, so there's a brick wall and then uh, and further up, like you can see concrete uh, poured brick walls, but while below it's a, it's a wood frame. So this is a, this is a mixed structure. On the other side, uh, a hybrid system, you know, uh, above you have a steel frame or a metal frame structure on top of a brick uh, foundation. So there weren't as many of these buildings because we expected there to be more, but there was only around 3% uh, of our survey total buildings uh, appeared to be like this. And most of the time, uh, this results in if it's uh, the steel structure on top, which is a cheaper structure, that's you know people just trying to put up an extra story because their family has gotten bigger or their work has gotten bigger. On the other side, if they've put up a more concrete brick uh, structure, it's probably the family's gotten bigger, but they've, they're slightly more richer than, than before and now they can afford that. The problem with this uh, in the earthquake we saw is that these buildings are actually more vulnerable because it's a heavier structure on top of a weaker uh, base. So we also wanted to identify these things and, and send it to uh, ImageCat and, and HOT and the team around there. Um, so this building, uh, what we used, uh, this is a bamboo structure. So we also encountered a few buildings like this in our sample of the 2,700 buildings, but like only 0.57% of the buildings uh, in our sample were like this. Um, finally, I mean the points that we went to, since they were random, it was completely randomly selected and then a random number was uh, generated and we just selected from that list. So you ended up uh, you know, going to the temple complex, for example, and uh, so this, this happened to be one of the buildings that they had to survey. Um, so we didn't like, uh, everything was randomly selected, but like the surveyors did have one flexibility, which was once they're at the site, certain places might not be accessible. So then they can go a little further out to uh, take the nearest uh, building to that building. Um, we also, did run into a slight problem where we had uh, a category called uh, industrial, but that ended up being mostly large government or military facilities. So the surveyors weren't allowed to go in there. So uh, that development pattern, you know, we struggled with finding exactly uh, the full uh, 40 times uh, uh, 10, 400 buildings for that particular development pattern. Um, but we still found enough that like it didn't affect the overall sampling process. Um, so this is my second last um, structure. This is actually a steel concrete composite structure. Um, it's very hard to see from the outside because you've got the metal sheets placed uh, below it. Um, but what the surveyors would be able to do is since this, this looks like a publicly accessible building, they would be able to go inside, sort of see the beams, um, sort of look at to see if like, you know, there is a steel concrete composite or not. And then uh, this building, as you can see right at the bottom, like all the top is covered by the facade, but at the bottom you can clearly see the stones. 
So this is a stone, uh, the material used in this building is stones. And um, we encountered only a very small fraction of the percentage of the buildings. So just uh, apart from the field survey, I just want to give some results because before we went to the field, for one month what we did was we actually remotely mapped Kathmandu city so that on the field, uh, the surveyors would know where the buildings are located on the map. So they would take the map with them, and they would be able to see that. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that in one month, we managed to uh, you know, increase the number of buildings in Kathmandu by 33%. And this was a particularly very difficult uh, task because for years, we've been trying to improve the map of Kathmandu, but because it's so densely mapped, it's very difficult to you know, just have volunteers do it and just make it a volunteer work. People try to avoid that sort of like mapping, they try to do the easier task where it's like, you know, clear cut. So we're very uh, proud that we managed to do that and we also added um, hundreds of kilometers of roads as well in the process. So Kathmandu's uh, map looks really good. Um, uh, just to show you guys what that actually means is we've created a before and after map. So any random area uh, within Kathmandu, if you go in, if you zoom in further, let's say this area, you can see that there's a lot of blank spaces here. Uh, but like afterwards, you know, you'll see that like, you know, buildings start appearing like this. Um, so other areas as well, a lot more buildings than before. So uh, you can explore this uh, web, web link if you want to like, you know, really look at like where did the mapping work uh, remotely validated work really affect the details. So each of these uh, gray grayscales are buildings. And uh, there's still tons to do in terms of mapping over there. So if you want to help out with that, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, Um, so at the end of the field work, um, we surveyed 2,700 odd buildings and then, uh, you know, s uh, several uh, tags such as like building levels, building roof materials, shape, all of these were added. So this is the result of the survey in Kathmandu. Um, uh, the NA should be 100%. Sorry, I forgot to change that. <laughs> uh, so that was a 100% increase in those tags. So basically before those buildings, uh, if there was a polygon that existed, didn't have those tags. And afterwards, you know, like you can see 2,694, 2,698, or 2,701. So some of these uh, were difficult. For example, building age, we couldn't accurately say all of them. But we've said like before 2000 or after 2000. Um, but this is the sort of information we collected. We've put uh, sources in all of the uh, survey that we did. Uh, we've sourced uh, as the field survey work done by Meteor. And then in uh, 266 buildings, there's also a fix me tag for certain mistakes that we encountered so that if somebody else can see it later, then they can address it. So our idea is that like, you know, uh, once we've done this work as a member of OSM Nepal, as a member of uh, the community, we continue mapping on OSM and improving the data as well. So I would like to ask my colleague, Emmanuel to come up and talk about their experience doing the same thing in Tanzania. Yeah, ahead. Hello, everyone. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, on top of that, my name is my name is Emmanuel Kombe. Um, I'm working with uh, Hot Tanzania or slash. Yeah, you may call it Open Map Pool Development Tanzania. Therefore, therefore, yeah, concerning concerning about the illustration that was, uh, yeah, was talking about the, the overview of the of the media project, as well as how how the some of the of the training, yeah, concerned concerned about the about the project, yeah, starting from the yeah from from the training about the, the engineers to. Yeah, to impart some of the of the capacities, so as to be able to collect some of, of the information. That also that also was uh, yeah was conducted 
in Tanzania, though, though our, our, our system of the, of the training was, uh, was so much, much different from the Kathman. As you know, as you know, yeah, as you know, in your city, yeah, in our city that is called Dar es Salaam, yeah, I will, I will illustrate the, the steps, yeah, for the data collections. Though, though, though in the, in the media project, we have set, like, yeah, three stages, like pre, yeah, pre-site activities, as well as, uh, as site activities, and at the end, we have like a, we have like a after after data collection. Yeah, on the map there, yeah, it it, it illustrates some of the homogeneous zones that we have been yeah, created with the, our partner, our partner who is called the Image Cut. We have like a, we have like seven homogeneous zones. That is urban development zone. We have a industrial zone high urban development zone, informal zone, single family residential, natural forest land, as well as a rural settlement area. These towns were, were, yeah, were created yeah, according to the image, yeah, according to the, to the aerial image, as well as some of the, yeah, of, of the buildings that are actually being yeah, located yeah, in there, as well as, yeah, as, well as how how some of the activities are actually being running in some of the of the certain zones. Yeah, after that, yeah, after that, I have said, I have said we have we have like three stages. We have pre-site activities that include the remote digitization that were some of the of the places in the as well as some of the small region that is called Puan. Most of the yeah of the building has already been digitized, though though they they were actually using yeah being image as well as a digital premium image. So uh, after that, we have been we have been provided with the new new drone image that has got a a high resolution of 10 centimeters. Therefore, our team has started to start to redigitize again the building footprints according to the homogeneous zones that we have been provided by the image card. Therefore, the aim, the aim is to make sure the shapes as well as the alignments is well, is well cleared. Yeah. Therefore, most of the, most of the, of the softwares that we have been, we have been used yeah, in the digitization we have started in the creation of tasks, yeah, and then and then using using what what the what the most common yeah softwares that have been used in the in the process of making alignment as well as yeah as making sure each of the yeah each of the buildings aligned yeah clearly yeah according to the according to the shape as well as yeah according to how roof is. Yeah, etc. Therefore, yeah, as you can see, the left picture yeah represent some of the yeah of the building foot, footprints that were 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 before yeah digitization, and the, the other side yeah shows shows yeah building footprints that were redigitized by by using by using drone image that were who have been provided by the Ministry of Land from the from the our partner that is called Koi. Yeah, you can see that was the was the statistics of the digitization process. As you know, yeah, before before we have like a nine three two, and the after 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 digitization process, yeah, you, you can see we have twelve nine thirty one. That you that you can see the difference of two thousand and the nine ended, and the nine nine. Yeah, uh, after that, after that, now we have, yeah, we, we have moved to the site activities that uh, we have been imparted like uh, two free softwares. As you know, humanitarian open street map, we are actually, we are, we are actually promoting the free software 
Therefore, ODK was actually used. Yeah, plus the OMK. OMK, uh, as you know, the Android free application that uh, is uh, user friend. And anyone, uh, anyone with the uh, Android phone has an uh, ability to, yeah, to install it in his phone or her phone and start to use it. Yeah, though, though we have started in the, in the creation of the, of the questionnaires, and after that we have been integrated the, the questionnaire form yeah, within a certain OMK server, and uh, after that, after that ODK, ODK were actually being yeah, configured with the, with the OMK server that has got the, the form with the questionnaires, and uh, after that, as you know, some of the, some of the questionnaires are uh, very difficult to be captured with the ODK, but uh, on, the, on the case of OMK has an, an ability to touch a certain building. Therefore, most of the, of the questionnaires were being kept within the OMK. Therefore, we have actually using both ODK and OMK that uh, we have started to load the form from the ODK and then adding the extension from OMK so as to be able to touch the building and they started to add some of the information at the site. Yeah, and that, yeah, we can see also the interface of the OMK server. You can see we have home, we have also deployments, as well as how we can upload form. Those are the, some of the, of the submissions that have been collected at the site and, uh, and being sent to the, to the OMK server. Therefore, yeah, you can see, as well as the preview, plus uh, there you can, you can also download it, that in the form of the OSM file, as well as uh, any, form, any format, uh, if you wish, yeah, you, you can download. Also, also, OMK server has an ability, an ability to, to overview or to look some of the areas that a team that uh, yeah, a certain team or a certain submission have uh, been collected. And uh, you, 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 can, uh, you can either select yeah, to see some of the informations that have been co collected at the site. And uh, on, the, on the right side, you can see many of the informations that have been captured uh, when somebody is uh, at the site. Also, also after, uh, yeah, as I've said, we have pre, yeah, pre-site activities, and then we have a data collection process, and at the end we have like, we have like, yeah, after collection process. Therefore, we are also using the a map campaign that was the tool that we are being created by the humanitarian open street map, yeah, in order to, yeah, to monitor and, and, and to see the, the, the completeness of the, of the certain features attribute yeah, within the site. Therefore, this has also, also been the part of, of our process since, since, since you will be able to see the, yeah, the completeness of, of, a certain, of a certain feature attributes. But after being, after being cleaned and uploaded the OSM, you'll be able to see, to see how, many, how many features have been collected here in the river. That was the example of, of the map campaign that, uh, that uh, have been done within the high urban development zone. Therefore, you can see features collected is a 230 as well as the uh, areas being covered. Yeah, though, though, yeah, we can see, we can see some, some, some different scale on the, on the green type. Yeah, it shows the completeness of the whole of the, of the attributes while the, other, other colors shows the incompleteness of some of the, of the features. Also, at the end, at the end, we have get like, like 2,951 buildings, though some of the, some of the building footprints has pre-existing yeah, information, but we have been able to capture, yeah, 2,951, yeah, within the whole seven homogeneous zone. And there are other, other, some of the, some of the features. Features, yeah, before, before it counts, yeah, starting from building, as well as from, from, from the source. Though some of the, of the, of the attribute information were somehow very new. Therefore, after, 
after data collection, and they have been uploaded to the OSM, you can see they have rise up to 2951. And there are the, some of the summary according to the homogeneous zones. They are starting from high urban, though, yeah, you can see some of the, some of the homogeneous zones has got the higher, higher number of the building, yeah, than, than, than some of the, of the homogeneous zone. You can see there, Hayaban has got the, yeah, 500 and 84 buildings, while the small number is a thin, yeah, rural, yeah, is within the industrial development zone with the 422. And at the end, this one of the, some of the, of the lesson loans, Lendi, though we have got some of the challenges, we have to, yeah, to constantly uh, updating some of the information collected. As you know, many of the, of the buildings are actually being damaged or demolished. Therefore, we have to, to, to continue updating some of the information that uh, have been captured during the media project. Also, also some of the, of the activities we underestimated some of the resources as well as the, as, as time allocation. Therefore, if we, if we, we, we yeah, if we're gonna have some of the, of the information next or some of the activities next, we have to, to quick and the, and the clear allocated some of the, of, of the resources according to the time as well as uh, according to the old process of data collection. Also, the other lesson learned, Chosen sample. We have to choose the equal number of the, uh, of the sample according to the homogeneous zones so as to get the, the actual number and the same number of the, of the, yeah, of the, yeah, we have to choose the equal number of sample, yeah, at the beginning so at the end we'll get the equal number of the, of the building that you have been surveyed during the process. Therefore, after that, all the data have been cleaned and validated, and up to now have been uploaded to the, to the OpenStreetMap with the source tag, Meteor, Dar es Salaam, Underground Survey, 2019. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have a question actually for, for whoever wants to answer. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, because it applies to, to, to both works. Uh, first of all, like, excellent work. I mean, this is, the, this is uh, remarkable that, uh, that is being done. Uh, the, I was thinking, um, so I had uh, two questions. So one, about when, when, when you want to use this information to extrapolate the impact of a disaster, you, you need to draw conclusions on the whole, whole area on top of the buildings that you surveyed, so you have to extrapolate. So I guess, what, what is the idea that within the uniform area, the f which you define with satellite images, you assume that the building characteristics are the same of the ones that you surveyed? Is that the logic? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, w with the methodology, um, so I also want to quickly show that, like, you know, um, there is a blog that we've written um, on, on how, uh, this not 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 this one, but uh, there's there's a there's a blog on if you go to the Hot OSM uh, website, there's a blog on how the remote mapping points are used and also how the buildings were sampled. So specifically, when it comes to this, so first you just using the satellite imagery, what they did is they looked at homogeneous zones, they separated it into seven different zones, or in 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 their case also it was seven, right, uh, and then. And then within that, what we did was uh, just random points. So 40 random points within that zone were taken. And then 10 buildings around each of those points were surveyed. So that becomes a sample. And then so you can extrapolate 
about just that region. Okay. Obviously, the challenge is also we don't know how accurate the satellite imagery is. So this because this was the first time it's being done. So the in the in the field it might be a lot different than what the satellite is saying is is a homogeneous zone as well. Yeah. So there is that challenge as well. And that process was actually done by ImageCat, so they were the ones that identified from the satellite imagery through various um, processes to identify the development pattern types. And then so the combination of it was that we're going and kind of verifying, collecting the details for what they assumed were these like pattern types, and then they're dropping it into it and then you extrapolating for within those zones that they have identified as cons and from the data seeing that we have collected that it is kind of ground truth that it's correct. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. If no one has or no one else has. No, sorry to <laughs> hijack the Q and A session. Um, now and then the second question. So about thinking about scalability. So because having engineers uh, or experts doing this job is well, it's fantastic. It's how you do it the best you can. But then I'm imagining where you, when you don't have such an expertise, the only information that maybe it's easy to sample uh, from uh, from this from us from from the view from the street is just the building material. So which of the 20 features that you showed, which are the crucial ones to actually f forecast the impact of a disaster? Good question. Um, so this work actually follows on from the GFDRR Challenge Fund in 2016, where we actually developed the data models for not only buildings, but also like power plants, roads, bridges. And we worked with you know people, specialists in that field who identify structural attributes, you know, that help determine when points of failure. And for each of them, because it's a very extensive list, which in reality we said, like, if you're a specialist, you can identify those. But if we wanted to actually have, you know, people crowdsourcing it or contributing, it's not feasible. So we actually do have that listed on the wiki. So if you wanted to have a look at it, we could pull it up now, but it's actually, um, listed on there as the GED for all um, database, which is like global exposure database for all. And we have separated out two with their help, like what is sort of, you know, there's a huge extensive wish list and then a, just like a core, you're like the ones that are definitely needed. And that's a much more summarized um, version. So yeah, you'll be able to see. GED for, sorry, I'm not. Yeah, I think we're gonna. GED for all, okay. For all. Um, what we've done is we, we did localize some of these attributes. So we had local engineers sit down and then like we worked on like trying to like um, certain things, uh, certain attributes we felt would not apply to Kathmandu, Nepal. So we, we tried to like change that and like modify that. So our tagging list is also in that uh, blog post that I showed. So what attributes and what tags we've used or what tags we've created. So that has all been done with a local context in mind. 